Zephaniah 2, starting in verse 4. Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon left in ruins. At midday, Ashdod will be emptied, and Ekron uprooted. Woe to you who live by the sea! O Carathite people, the word of the Lord is against you. O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you, and none will be left. The land by the sea where the Carathites dwell will be a place for shepherds and sheep pens. It will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. There they will find pasture. In the evening they will lie down in the houses of Ashkelon. The Lord their God will care for them. He will restore their fortunes. I have heard the insults of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites, who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the land. The nations on every shore will worship him, everyone in its own land. You too, O Cushites, will be slain by my sword. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate and dry as the desert. Flocks and herds will lie down there, creatures of every kind. The desert owl and the screech owl will roost on her columns. Their calls will echo through the windows. Rubble will be in the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. This is the carefree city that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am, and there is none besides me. What a ruin she has become. A lair for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. Maybe you remember from when you were younger, or maybe if you are younger, you remember from this week or a couple weeks ago or whatever. You remember when one of your siblings was facing some parental discipline. They had done something that had drawn the ire of mom and dad, and so you're there and you're watching as brother or sister is being chastised for their transgression of some sort, and you're taking some kind of sick pleasure in it. You're enjoying as your brother or sister is being yelled at by mom or dad. Maybe you're even just sneakily out of sight from mom and dad, off in the corner, snickering, pointing, or going, Oh, I can't believe, oh, I would never do something like that. Or you're, you're cheering mom or dad on, giving a little bit of a, yeah, you tell him. And then all of a sudden, mom or dad turns to you and says, As for you, young man... And you recognize that you have not escaped the ever-watchful parental gaze. And your transgressions as well have been marked out for discipline. One might expect that Judah's neighbors are feeling kind of like that snickering sibling. They have watched with delight, they have listened with delight as the prophets have announced that the God of Israel, the God of Judah, is going to visit upon them judgment and discipline for their sins. Judah is going to face divine discipline. And you can almost hear the nations of the earth snickering. Oh, these people of God! Oh, this, these people of David! God was with them. He gave them their land. But now look! Now they're going to be destroyed. And look, we, we will get their land. And God turns to them, as it were, and says, As for you, He turns their thoughts on their head and says, That's not how it's going to work. God will be just. And He will bring His judgments upon His own people, as He said. But God will vindicate Himself and will vindicate His justice against all the nations and against all the peoples of the earth. It won't just be Judah. Judah is marked out specifically throughout the course of chapter 1. You see that Judah is spoken of that there's going to be loud wails and crashes 
and cries. The prince's sons and or the king's sons and the princes are going to be specifically judged. There's going to be blood spilled like dust and entrails spilled like common dung. There's going to be distress and there's going to be blindness. There's all of this, but, but Zephaniah has said explicitly as well that it will not just be the people of God who face judgment. Chapter 1, verse 3, he said, The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth. Or in chapter 1, verse 18, he said as well, He will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. And now the Lord, having explicitly said that, now the Lord makes the same point very clearly but implicitly. That it will not just be Judah and Jerusalem who face the wrath and the judgment and the swift justice of God. But all the nations, all the sinful peoples of the earth will face the justice of God as well. And Zephaniah makes this point not by making a catalog of all the peoples of the earth that he knew at the time of his life. He doesn't go through his mind doing some sort of an encyclopedia a knowledge of all the nations that could possibly exist and begin making a list of them to make sure that he doesn't forget anybody who could possibly face his judgment. Instead, Zephaniah makes the point with a literary feature. He's going to pronounce in this section that's before us today judgment against four different nations and these four different nations are five different nations but two are lumped together these four different nations exist at the cardinal points of the compass as they're related to judah i have a little map slide if we could try to get that thrown up there now if you can see that perhaps you can you see that here judah is circled in red and all the nations that that zephaniah points out are circled in blue He begins off to the west with Philistia, which is on the far eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea. And he's going to jump far to the east, and he's going to talk about Moab and Ammon. And he's going to go to the south. Cush is actually off the map. Cush is like down here. It's at the headwaters of the Nile River. And he's going to go back north to the the arch nemesis of Judah at the time, which was the nation of Assyria. And by highlighting all the four cardinal points of the compass, He's making a very clear, strong point that all the peoples of the earth, whether to the west or to the east or to the south or to the north, all the peoples of the earth, none will escape the just judgments of God. So he begins with the Philistines, who are the historic enemies of the people of God in verses verses 4 to 7. Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon left in ruins. At midday, Ashdod will be emptied, and Ekron uprooted. Woe to you who live by the sea, O Carathite people! The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you, and none will be left. The land by the sea, where the Carathites dwell, will be a place for shepherds and sheep pens. It will belong to the remnant of the house of Judah. There they will find pasture. In the evening they will lie down in the houses of Ashkelon. The Lord their God will care for them. He will restore their fortunes. Gaza and Ashdod and Ashkelon, these are all Philistine cities. The Philistines were the historic enemies of the people of God. You probably know the Philistines best for their great champion Goliath that David slew with the sling and a single stone. But the Philistines had been long-time enemies of the people of God. They were immigrants, really, to the Promised Land. They were sea peoples. They had originated in Crete or other islands in the Aegean Sea. They had migrated out of those areas because of a great famine, and they had looked for a place to call their own. They had first tried to land and settle in Egypt, but the Egyptians were less than hospitable, and they expelled them from the land, so they got back in their boats, and they kept making their way until they made their way to Palestine and the Levant, and there they settled along the coast, right in the area that God had already promised to Abraham and to his descendants. But they're outsiders. They're culturally different from the rest of the people around Judah. That's why they refer to oftentimes as the uncircumcised Philistines. They don't share the same customs. And they were bitter enemies of the people of God. They delighted to make the life of the people of God miserable. 
They were constantly harassing, constantly oppressing. We read about that in Judges and in 1 Samuel. They were the ones who fought battle against King Saul when Saul fell on his sword rather than be killed by the Philistines. They were the ones who took him and hung his body up to show to all the people that this is Israel's king. There's all kinds of harassment and oppression and servitude and humiliation which the Philistines delighted to put upon the people of Judah. And they would have loved to hear that Judah's God, the God of David who had finally subdued them, that Judah's God was going to come and wipe out Judah itself. You can feel them snickering. But God turns the tables on them. He says, your cities will be abandoned. Your land will be judged as well. He says, I will destroy you and none will be left. God has spoken a word of judgment against them. A word of destruction against them. And whenever God says, He is perfectly powerful and perfectly faithful to bring about. The Philistines were merchants and traders. They had a large fleet that would go all across the Mediterranean to trade and to win wealth of various kinds. Their land sat along the most lucrative trade route in the world. At that time, they had bustling cities and thriving industries of all different kinds, but God says that their land, though it was populated and rich, would become wilderness place for sheep and goats and shepherds. But more than that, God promises that their land would one day belong to the remnant of the Israelites. That it would belong to the descendants of Judah. That one day the people of God, the people of Judah, would either return from exile or those who escaped going into exile at all, would inherit again not just the land of Judah, but they would inherit even the land of the Philistines. And this is in perfect accordance with what God had said in Deuteronomy 30, verses 1, 2, and 3. He says, When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today, Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. God is going to have no compassion on the Philistines. He's going to, and he would in time, utterly destroy them. But he's going to have grace for his people. He's going to remember them. He's going to gather them together again. He's going to restore them to their land. He's going to restore their blessing. He's going to reverse the curses He put upon them in chapter 1. And He will once again be their God, and they will once again be His people. So right in the midst of God's judgment on the Philistines is an announcement of mercy for His people. And so having started in the west, then Zephaniah jumps to the east, to Moab and Ammon. He says this in verses 8-11. to I have heard the insults of Moab and the taunts of the Ammonites who insulted my people and made threats against their land. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, surely Moab will become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits, a wasteland forever. The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome to them when He destroys all the gods of the land. The nations on every shore will worship Him. Everyone in its own land. Moab and Ammon are are distant relatives of the people of Israel. Moab and Ammon were nations that arose out of Lot's incestuous relationship with his daughters. 
You may recall the story. We had enough scandal and drama in our Women in Waiting Advent series. Won't go into all the details, but Lot and his daughters decided they needed to hide out in a cave after God came and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. His daughters got desperate. They got their, they got their dad drunk, and one thing led to another, and now you've got the Ammonites and the Moabites, and the Ammonites and the Moabites hated the Israelites. They, even though they came from the same place and from the same migration, yet the Ammonites and the Moabites delighted to make life difficult for the Israelites. When the Israelites were coming up out of Egypt, they asked permission to pass through the land of the Ammonites and the Moabites on their way into Canaan, and the Ammonites and the Moabites didn't just say no, but they said no, and they actually hired a magician or a sorcerer to put a curse upon them. Then in 1 Samuel chapter 10, you come to an account where the Ammonites have laid siege to an Israelite city. And the Israelites say, well, we'll let us surrender to you. You can have our city. And they say, you may surrender, but if you do, we're going to gouge out the right eye of every man who lives in your city. We are going to embarrass you. And we are going to hurt you. And then in 1 Samuel 11... David, when he becomes king, he sends some diplomats to the Ammonites in good faith. And the Ammonite king takes those diplomats sent in good faith. He shaves their heads, he shaves their beards, he humiliates them. If that's not enough, he cuts off their clothes right above the butt so that they have to go home embarrassed and ashamed for everybody to see. They made life a perpetual nuisance. Made themselves a perpetual nuisance, perpetual thorn in the side of the people of God. And they would continue that for quite some time. But God does not take kindly to those who are perpetually pains to his people. He would remember their taunts. He would remember their mocking and their insults. They have not gone unnoticed. The land of Moab was the land where Sodom and Gomorrah had been before God destroyed them. So Zephaniah says that as God had one time destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and made their cities a wasteland, so too he's going to once again bring destruction on this land. He's going to bring that kind of destruction on Moab and Ammon. And you recall the story of Lot and his family when they were fleeing from Sodom. The angel of the Lord said, you may flee and get out of here, run away, and, but don't look back. But Lot's wife loved the pleasures of Sodom, more than she loved obedience to the Lord. So she turns back, and she turns into a pillar of salt. And Zephaniah says the land of Moab and Ammon will be a place of salt pits because of their wickedness. But again, in the midst of this judgment against these historic enemies of the people of God, there is mercy, and there is grace spoken of about the people of God. At the very end of verse 9, it says, The remnant of my people will plunder them. The survivors of my nation will inherit their land. Not only will God's people inherit the land of the Philistines to the west, but they'll also inherit the land of the Moabites and the Ammonites to the east. In the midst of judgment, there is hope. That hope comes to us more in verse 11 before that. We recognize that in the Moabites and the Ammonites, the root of their sin is idolatry. And idolatry inevitably leads to pride. And the proverb says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And there at the beginning of verse 11, it says, the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the land. But the literal translation is more that when God starves the gods of the land. It isn't just that God is going to destroy them, but he's going to demonstrate that they are powerless. They are impotent. He's going to strangle their gods before the eyes of the people. He's going to show that they are powerless to save, powerless to feed and to clothe, powerless to, to protect or to preserve. He's going to demonstrate that even while Judah languishes under his justice, he is still God. And their false gods are just that, false gods. But then, in verse 11, you have the first real clear shining beacon of hope in the book of Zephaniah. It almost seems out of place. 
right after these crushing judgments leveled against Philistia and the Moabites and the Ammonites comes this seemingly out of nowhere, this ray of hope, and it says the nations on every shore will worship him. That is, that even as the Philistines are on the shore of the Mediterranean and the Moabites and the Ammonites are on the shore of the Dead Sea, so as every nation all around the world, every nation is one day going to worship the Lord in their own land. You have a reversal here in view because in the Old Testament, typically, people came to Jerusalem to worship. The feasts and the festivals and all the great sacrifices, they all happened at the temple in Jerusalem. And that day, the paradigm was you go from out to in to worship. But Zephaniah says here, worship is going to go out. People will worship wherever they are in their own lands, in their own nations, in their own places, in their own homes. They'll worship in their own languages. Worship is going to belong to all people, but it will still be worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's us. Do you see us? We're on the shore of Lake Michigan. We worship in our own language, in our own land. We worship the God, though, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't have to hop on a Boeing and fly to Jerusalem to worship. We have to plow our driveways and shovel out the place the snow plows left, but we can get here to worship. And for those who are watching on the video, because you couldn't shovel your driveway, you can sit at home and worship. But Zephaniah speaks of the nations worshiping the God of Judah. And we need to do away with the character of the God of the Old Testament once and for all. Because the caricature of the Old Testament God is that somehow he was an inwardly focused God. And his people were also exclusively inwardly focused. They only cared about themselves, except every once in a while to go out and give the nations a good smiting. But that runs against the entire trajectory of the Old Testament. If you are an honest scholar of the Old Testament, you cannot say with integrity that the God of the Old Testament was exclusively inwardly focused. When God comes to Abraham, the most important figure in the Old Testament, what does he say to him? The first words out of his mouth are, and in you I will bless all all the nations of the earth. And God makes a perpetual pattern of including other nations in his people. You have Melchizedek, the priest king, who's not a descendant of Abraham. You have Tamar and Rahab and Ruth. You have Moses' wife, Zipporah, and her father, Jethro, who was a Midianite. You have provision for people coming into the covenant. You even have, in the Old Testament law, provisions for taking outsiders, Gentiles, and bringing them into the people of God that they might share in the Passover meal. The entire trajectory of the Old Testament is an inclusion of the nations. Zephaniah announces here that one day all those nations will be included. And Jesus practices that. We see that when Jesus is born, the nations come to Him. The Magi come to Him. They bring to Him gifts. Jesus meets with the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. He commands the Gospel to go to the nations in the Great Commission. And He accomplishes that, we see, in Revelation 5 when people from every nation are before the throne of God. The idea... That somehow the God of the Bible is an inwardly focused God is foolishness for those who have read the Bible. And Zephaniah right here in the midst of God leveling just judgments against people who hate Him and His people, yet even then announces that mercifully people from even these nations will one day worship Him. Not even in Jerusalem but in their own land. So having gone from west to east, now Zephaniah goes south to Cush. A very brief verse in verse 12. You too, O Cushites, will be slain by my sword. This is brief. There will be destruction and it will be swift. And this sword language, again, is an allusion to Deuteronomy, which plays very largely in Zephaniah's mind in the time of Josiah. Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 40, we read, As surely as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand grasps it in judgment, I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. 
I will make my arrows drunk with blood while my sword devours flesh, the blood of the slain and the captives. God is a swift judging God who does not deal lightly with His enemies. And we said that is true of Christ as well. We read this in Revelation 19 regarding when Christ returns to judge the nations. I saw heaven standing open. And there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. The idea here is as simple as the verse is short. God will come with swift justice to judge all the nations of the earth. And the last nation that is mentioned is to the north, the powerhouse nation and the most dangerous nation at the time, the Assyrian Empire in verses 13 to 15. He will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, leaving Nineveh utterly desolate, as dry as the desert. Flocks and herds will lie down there, creatures of every kind. The desert owl and the screech owl will roost on her columns. Her calls will echo through the windows. Rubble will be in the doorways. The beams of cedar will be exposed. This is the carefree city that lived in safety. She said to herself, I am, and there is none besides me. What a ruin she has become, a lair for wild beasts. All who pass by her scoff and shake their fists. Nineveh was the capital city, or one of the capital cities anyways, of the Assyrian Empire. It was a very large and luxurious city. And it was full of incredible wealth. And that was because all the wealth of all the plundered nations the Assyrians had captured and conquered had flown into Nineveh. It was wealth with the plunder of the entire ancient Near East. It was the most powerful and stable and secure city in its time. It was the Assyrians who had conquered and deported and exiled the people of the northern kingdom and who had continually threatened to do the same to the people of Judah for quite some time. They were at the time the greatest international threat to the people of God. And God says, that this most powerful of cities and this most powerful of peoples, this place, is going to waste away to nothing. That it's going to become a place for owls and barren wilderness animals. It's going to be a place where nothing lives, nothing thrives. If you would have stood in the middle of Nineveh when Zephaniah is speaking this prophecy, you would have seen people and commerce and luxury and lavishness everywhere you looked. You would have seen power and strength and security and stability. You would have seen buildings that at the time would have seemed like they scraped the sky and temples to all different kinds of gods. You would have seen everything that looked like flourishing and thriving. And if someone, if you hadn't known better, someone would have walked up to you and said, within a hundred years, this is all going to be gone. You would have laughed in their face at how absurdly ridiculous it would have sounded. But the prophet Zephaniah comes and says exactly that. And he says, even her boasts will be silenced. She boasts, and she boasts blasphemously. Zephaniah records the the heart and the spirit of the Assyrians as saying, I am, and there is none besides me. That's blasphemy. Deuteronomy 32, we read this when the Lord says, See now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my Assyria was so self-confident 
viewed herself so powerfully, so invincibly, that she begins to speak of herself as God and attribute to herself the essence of God. I am, and there is no other. God will not be mocked. And God will not share His glory with anyone else, no matter how powerful or wealthy or stable or secure. And God will not share His glory, and so God will bring upon the Assyrians' destruction. So west and east, and south and north, all these cardinal points of the compass have been covered, and destruction and judgment and justice have been promised. But what's the point? The point is very simple. It's the point that Zephaniah wants to make in the course of the whole book. And the point is, wake up! Wake up. If you have been in spiritual slumber, wake up. If you have been dead in sin, may the Word of God wake you up. If you have, been, if you have had your conscience numbed by the perpetual cosmic treason that is sin, it is time to wake up, and it is time to wake up and do what is said in verse 3, which is to seek the Lord. Think about what matters. The Philistines were wealthy, and they were mighty warriors, and they were technologically advanced far beyond their neighbors of the time. But what does that matter now? What difference does it make? The Moabites and the Ammonites, they got that quick hit of seeing their, their perpetual foes in a rough spot. They got to see the enemy on his knees. They got the satisfaction that comes from that. But what difference does that make now? And the Cushites, they were a part of Egypt. They were part of one of the richest, most stable and secure empires and longest running empires the world has ever seen. What difference does that make now? And the Assyrians, they were the wealthiest, most powerful, most secure nation on earth for over a hundred years. They had more wealth and more security than any people in the ancient world knew what to do with. But the Lord said they would be destroyed. Zephaniah writes around 620 B.C., which is right towards the end of the height of Assyrian power. The historian Xenophon goes walking through the desert where Nineveh had once been just 200 years later in the year 401 B.C. And he goes looking, looking for Nineveh. He wants to find this once mighty city. And he comes and they say, there it is. And he looks and all he sees is sand. The city was buried. And it's still buried today. What difference did might and power and wealth, and luxury, and security make for them. What about you? Are the things that you're living for still going to be worth having lived for on the day when the glorious Christ we read about from Revelation returns to judge the living and the dead? Are the things that we're living for going to matter on the day when God comes to bring justice and judgment with swiftness is it going to matter to us? Is it going to matter to us? Are the things that we're living for actually worth living for? Leonard Ravenhill once asked the question, and it's engraved on his tomb, are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for? It's a question worth asking ourselves. When we see these mighty empires, Assyria and Egypt, Philistia, Moab, and Ammon, when we see them so easily struck down, what will become of us when God comes for us? If we are outside of Christ, if we are apart from faith in Christ, then we are no different from them. And when the Lord comes in judgment, we, just like them, will be struck down, never to rise again. But if you have claimed Christ, and if you have committed yourself to Christ, then you will be sheltered in the day of the Lord. But Paul has more to say for us. Even for us who belong to Christ, Paul has more to say in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, each one should build with care 
For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Paul gives a metaphor of a house. A house which is built on a foundation. And the foundation is Christ. You might build an incredible looking house, but if it's built off the foundation of Christ, it's not worth anything. We might remember the the story Jesus tells of the man who builds the house on the rock and the man who builds the house on the sandy land. Don't build your house. You you know the song, right? If If you're off the foundation of Christ, it doesn't matter how glorious your foundation or your building looks, it will amount to nothing. But then for those who are on the foundation of Christ, we build a structure, a home, as it were. And we build it with our time and with our talents. And those are are worth different amounts. There are some who build with costly stones, gold, and silver. Things that have great value. And things which can pass through fire and survive. Those are love, obedience to God, service to God, love for His people, obedience to Christ, and love for Christ. But we might also build with hay, with straw, and with wood. Those are trivial pursuits, meaningless things, desires of self. And in the end, what we have lived for, or what we have not lived for, are going to be displayed for all to see. But perhaps most horrifically, for us to see. And we'll see what was pure and what was not. And what was pleasing to God and done for the Lord and what was done for self. We'll see how much time we didn't make the best use of and how much we did. And we'll be rewarded or not according to what endures through the righteous flames of God's refining justice. The Lord would have you, from Zephaniah 2, the Lord would have you be compelled if you are off the foundation of Christ to get on to the foundation of Christ. He would have you see what comes to those who mock the people of God. What comes to those who mock God Himself. He would have you see what comes to those who are enemies of Christ and of his church. And he would have you repent and get on the foundation of Christ. And for those of you who are on the foundation, and he would have you be compelled to live for what matters. To give yourself diligently and faithfully to the service of the Lord. Not, co- not to content yourself with the things of this world. Not to live for the Assyrian dream or for the American dream, but to live with love and with service, with worship, in obedience to God and to His Word. And if you have been sleeping, and if you have been sleeping even perhaps in the death of sin, then God would have the prophet Zephaniah be to you an alarm clock to wake you up and to call you to love Christ, and to live for Him, and to seek the Lord.